Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor David. Last week we talked about how to worship God. This week we're talking about salvations, signs, and seals. What are salvations, signs, and seals according to the Holy Writ? Excuse? Well, yes, I suppose. Um, think more something that we'll be doing in a little while. Communion, the Lord's Supper, is one. What's the other one? Worship. Baptism. There are two signs and seals of salvation in the Protestant Church, and only two baptism and the Lord's Supper. Have you ever heard them called sacraments? Have you ever heard them called ordinances? What is the difference, if any, between a sacrament and an ordinance? Yes, but more the word ordain. It's an ordainance. Who ordained baptism and the Lord's Supper? Jesus. Jesus. Now, what's the sacrament? Hey, what? What? But what is, what's the difference between calling it an ordinance and calling it a sacrament? If you go back to the Latin word ordinance, order, sacrament, sacred, so on. Do you know what's behind sacrament? When I was a little boy, going down the road with my dad, going past St. Anne's Church or any other Catholic church, he used to make the sign of the cross mm -hmm. on his head or forehead as we traveled past the church. Mm -hmm. Why? No, because the body of Christ was in that building in a golden vessel called a tabernacle. It was the communion bread. And it was holy, so Christ was in there, and he would make the sign of the cross, as would any self-respecting Catholic, even today, those who know. When we're done doing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper today, where does the extra bread go? Where does the extra Wine, if you will, go. There was once a fine member of this church. He used to take the bread, and I remember seeing it, and he used to cast it out on the snow for the birds to eat. Was he wrong? 
After you baptize a baby, do you take the water and put it into the sewer system? Or do you put it in the sacristy of the church? Where is the sacristy of the church? It's below your feet. There's a dry well in the church below your feet over there. The pipe for which is in my office. The extra communion water is considered holy and can only be thrown on the ground not in the sewer system. So the priest would put it in the sacristy pipe and it would go all the way down two floors into the dry well below the church. You see what's happening here? That the elements are deemed mysteriously holy. So, The word sacrament, like the word trinity, is an extra-biblical term. It's not in the Bible. It entered theology by means of the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was the first translation of the Bible into a language other than its original languages. The Latin Vulgate was translated by Jerome. The Latin Vulgate was the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church, and I think it still is. The word was rendered mysterion. Mysterious, these practices of baptism in the Lord's Supper, they say. Um, And certain people like Baptists And others say ordinances, not sacraments. Catholics would say sacraments. Presbyterians would say sacraments. Lutherans would say sacraments. Baptists would say ordinances. Congregationalists could be either. In most Protestant churches... The sacraments, if you will, are two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. In the Roman Catholic Church, there are seven. The two already mentioned, plus the ceremonies of penance, hence what? The confessional, confirmation, marriage, holy orders. What's that mean? When someone becomes a priest or a nun? And final unction or extreme unction. What's that mean? Last rites, death. Got to get a priest in. Got to get a priest in to do the last rites before you die. Otherwise, it could be iffy. Peter Lombard called a sacrament a sign of a sacred thing. John Calvin wrote that a sacrament is an outward sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences the promises of goodwill toward us in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. And we, in turn, attest our piety toward him in the presence of the Lord and of his angels and before men. The ordinances. The divine ordinances were instituted by Jesus himself. Material elements are used as a visible sign of God's blessing. In baptism, it's water. In the Lord's Supper, it's what? Bread and wine. And for a long time, people were only using bread. Is that right? No, you need both. And why do we use grape juice and not wine? I didn't tell you once. I'll give you the story in two sentences. There was a movement in the United States that drinking any alcohol was bad. It was called the temperance movement. It existed between 
the late 1800s and early 1900s, it ended up in a constitutional amendment called Prohibition. And it was a failed experiment. People made tons of money because they smuggled liquor in, including some famous people, brought it in from Scotland, Scotch from Scotland. In any event, there was a dentist. His name was Thomas Welch. And he said, goodness, we can't have wine in communion. And I don't even think it was wine. Jesus wouldn't have drank wine because wine's bad. It's got alcohol in it. And I say to you, what about the miracle at Cana? They just drink a lot of grape juice and say, well, you only bring out the best grape juice later. <laughs> After we've had our, our grape juice, it's up to here. No, it was wine, real wine. Although some to this very day say it wasn't. And so the church switched, the churches switched to grape juice instead of wine because of the temperance movement. Dr. Welch, who firmly believed that, was the leading edge of it and had a cultivar of grapes that came from Concord, Massachusetts called Concord Grapes. And the company Welch's. And he made a killing. And so today, we still do grape juice. Although every once in a while, people bandy about and say, let's get back to wine. But we're afraid to do it because some people struggle with alcoholism. We don't want to get into that. So we haven't got into it. We're in enough trouble already. <laughs> The Lord's Supper points to the reality of our communion with him. In the case of the sacraments, the sign is secondary, outward, and visible. The reality is primary, inward, and invisible. I'm using the word sacraments. I, some would get you know, angry for me to use it. Um, guess what, folks? Despite what you heard, baptism and the Lord's Supper do not make you a Christian and don't keep you a Christian. In some traditions, they do make you a Christian and keep you a Christian. Did you know that? If you ever went to a funeral in some traditions, the priest will bring you right to the baptismal fount and say, Basically, he saved, he was baptized. He's basically saying, baptism made you a Christian. It doesn't. Or, we need to take communion every Sunday to maintain our faith. We don't. But, if you go to some traditions, they do. And they believe that that is what maintains their faith. That's why they go. They don't get anything from the service usually. Some, maybe something from the homily. But they go through the motions and they just need to get communion and they're all set for another week. And that's what I believed once when I was a dutiful member of Rome. That I was just getting what I needed for the week. See you next Sunday. We'll gas up again. A sign frequently indicates ownership. Baptism indicates that we are not our own, but are the Lord's because we have been bought with a price. Amen. Amen? The sacraments are means of grace to the one who rightly partakes of them. They're not conveying grace to you, but they are enriching, strengthening your faith. What do I say after communion? 
after we take communion. Does anybody know? Say the same thing every time we do it. Anybody catch it? And now, if you've ate and drank in faith, you have the assurance that your sins are forgiven you. If you take communion in faith, these things, the body and blood, you are eating the body and blood of Christ, meaning you are identifying, you're in union with the body and blood of Christ. If you do that in faith, you're saved. It's like working out your salvation. It's like a, you get it? That's why we do it, to remember Jesus and remember what he's done for us and remember we're saved. You see? Um, the error with the abuse of the sacraments, um, it was, faith was not really important. It was just doing it that was important. And so what did they do? What they often did was baptize someone at the very end of their lives because they weren't so sure that sins committed after baptism were forgiven. So there you are in your deathbed, you know, you're not even taking a bath anymore because you're all sitting there in your grossness, dying, right? Leave me alone. And they grab you and throw you in the lake. If that doesn't kill you, nothing will. And so, <laughs> but they did it because they figured he probably won't sin anymore. And we'll baptize and make sure he gets there. But do you see the error there? Because it doesn't make you a Christian. Today, there are South American folks that believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. That you, yeah, you do have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, but you also have to be baptized. And so I say to you, what happened to the thief on the cross? Was he baptized? No. He just said, remember me. Okay. They have value. They're not magic or mechanical, but they encourage and strengthen faith and believers, and they presuppose the grace that's already there. They're seals or certifications. You come into my office and you say, Pastor David, can you notarize this document? And I say, of course I can. And I notarize the document and it says, to, I say on it, that you came in and appeared personally before me, that I knew your identity and you signed it voluntarily for its stated purposes. I then sign and I put the seal on it. And then other people accept it. You can't have a deed transfer in Massachusetts without that because the person that's getting the deed wants to know you really signed it. It was really you. And you did it voluntarily. There wasn't a gun to your head. But the seal is an attestation. I attest. And if I attest wrongly or falsely, guess what? My day job will go from what it is now to selling pizzas. You can come in and see me. Would you like extra cheese on that one? <laughs> Baptism and uh, is like the Lord's attestation that you're in him. Now, what's the way you come to the Lord? I mean, how does somebody come to the Lord? Well, it makes you born again. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That would be an answer to the question, who makes you born again? But what makes you born again? Regeneration. What? Regeneration. Regeneration. And how does one become regenerated? 
Jesus said, you must be born again. How do you become born again? What do I do? Enter my mother's womb? She died in 2012. You have to have belief and faith. You have to have belief and faith. And what? And accept? Accept. How do I do? How do I how do I accept? Cast away your old life and Huh? Cast away your old life and take on Christ. Okay, but I'm in the church and I don't even know who's saved in this joint. I assume everybody is, but how do I know? Do we bring an organ out and play a sad song and have an altar call? Have everybody come down? And I lead you in an altar call and I say, Michael, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you. I have sinned against you. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Help me to live a holy life. Help me to live a holy life. Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. From this day forth. From this day forth. And forevermore. Forevermore. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He's saved. No, not unless it's really from the what soul. What are you saying? It is from the soul. It's just, just repeating just doesn't mean anything. It's ritualistic. It's just repeating it. You have to, you have to believe, believe in faith. Well, he does. Full water baptism. What's the entrance into the church? Front door? What's the entrance into the church? Somebody wants to be a church member. What do we say? What do we ask them? Are you a Christian? What's the second question? Are you baptized? And people say to me, I was baptized. And I say, when? That's really the telling question. When I was a baby, and I went, Aah! all the computers go off, flags come up. And the baptism team comes out and goes, <laughs> follow me? Okay. So who told us to baptize people in conjunction with them coming to Christ? Who told us this? John the Baptist? Jesus. Jesus, where? He said that we should all all of holiness. What's the two things that you've got to remember? They're called greats, two greats as a church. Two things which lead to three things. That's all you've got to remember in a church. First one is what? Great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Next one is great commission. Great commission. Read it. All authority in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Go therefore, what? Make disciples or converts? And teaching them? And what? What age? Are we still in the age? We are. The window of opportunity is still open. So love God, love people, make disciples. That's what a church does. Love God, love people, make disciples. That's what a Christian does. Love God, love people, make disciples. A Christian makes disciples. Right? And what do you do? Do you get them to say yes before you make disciples? Do you baptize them before or after discipleship? Yes, afterwards, right? Like I said before, don't think you're going to say three sentences and get somebody to come into the kingdom of God. They need to, and to know. Before I give my heart to somebody, I need to know. Don't you? Did you just marry your spouse and say, yeah, you look pretty good. Yeah, I'll sign up for a marriage. It was more than that, wasn't it? Got to get to know you. Yes, sir. Okay. So, <laughs> it's evident 
from these verses that baptism is the initiate. You look confused. Initiatory ordinance belonging to the task of making disciples. And the Lord Jesus Christ has all authority. And the baptized person recognizes it. Right? If you recognize that Jesus has all authority over you, do you live differently? Will there be times when you will say no to yourself? Will Jesus be standing over your shoulder saying, if you say yes to yourself, I will cut your head off? <laughs> Mostly not. I never heard of it. It's a life of faith, isn't it? And you have to say no to yourself a lot. We all do. Much more than we're doing now. Right? Especially in America, we have so much. Oh, yeah. Even though we're all broke now, according to the government, because we need an extra $12,000 to meet our budgets, we're still living pretty good, bro. Yeah, just go to a store. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Doesn't that mean that you have to be baptized to be saved? Some think so. What about the thief? All right. We should know that such a conclusion is wrong because of the teaching of the rest of Scripture about the way in which a person is to be saved by grace through faith in the death of Jesus alone. If baptism is required for salvation, then the believing thief who was crucified with Christ is lost. Once we get away from the idea that the verse is talking about water, and instead think of the believer's identification with Christ, then the statement becomes clear. You see, most of us are interpreting the Bible in English, and it's not supposed to be I mean, you have to dig, but there's so many resources. That word baptizo there doesn't mean baptized. It means more being identified with Jesus. In other words, you say it has more value, more juice. It has more depth of meaning than the English word baptized. But they didn't translate it wrong. It's just loaded. There's a lot of meaning in it. You know what I mean? Like, you can't translate the Bible, like, and think that everything's future to today. Otherwise, you'll be wrong about so many things. Um, look about this metaphorical meeting. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What does that mean? Well, it's especially significant in understanding baptism since the people of Israel were obviously not immersed either in the sea or the cloud. The cloud was behind them, separating them from the pursuing Egyptians, and the Egyptians were immersed in the sea, and they drowned in it. The meaning here is a change of identity. For the crossing of the Red Sea, the people were in rebellion against Moses. Their original attitude changed into an attitude of obedience and rejoicing after the Red Sea crossing. Did that last forever? No. Why? They're in the desert. They needed water. And what did they say? Let's go back to Egypt. They had onions and leeks and garlic. And I liked it there. Have you forgotten about the bricks and the straw? The lashes on the back? Now, so identification, you know, make sure you make that distinction. What about babies? Babies are so cute. They're so sweet. They're so innocent. They look so wonderful. And they're so clean and pure. 
And they're just laying there. Can babies be baptized? No. Can you be dedicated? That's different than being baptized. Do some people baptize babies? Yes. 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 And some people don't. What are the ones that baptize babies called? Besides Rowan. I'm sorry. Uh, what do they call them? Well, yeah, those, yeah. But there's more than that. There's Protestants that baptize babies. Pado-Baptists. Pado-Baptists. P-A-E-D-O-Baptists. Pado-Baptists. It means the baby sprinkler. The ones that <laughs> baptize babies. What's the other thing? If you say you don't baptize babies, what are you called? Anabaptist. What? Anabaptist. No. Anabaptist means baptized twice. What are you? <laughs> <laughs> You're what's called a credo Baptist. Credo Baptist. What's credo sound like to you? Yeah. Creed. Belief. So, Pado Baptists baptize babies. Before the baby can believe, credo-baptists baptize people only if they believe. Now, the difficulties with paedo-baptism is you can't determine if a baby believes or not. They're not formed enough to believe. So why do they baptize them? They say it's equivalent to circumcision. It's like a carryover from the Old Testament. That's why they have confirmation. They say this. This child has believing parents. And we're going to presume that they're Christian all of their lives. And we're going to raise them that way. And then when they get 15 years old, we're going to do what? We're going to confirm them to confirm our presumption that they're saved. And if they go through the confirmation, then they're saved. This church is credo-baptist because your pastor is credo-baptist. We presume that you're not saved <laughs> unless you give us a reason to think you are. Because if we presume you are saved... We may make a mistake of eternal proportion. So when, and as an if, you will come to Christ as a believing person, you say, Pastor, I want to be baptized. And a lot of people do. They grow up in the church around 12, 13, around there. They come, to church, they come and they say, I want to be baptized. And we determine whether we think their, their profession is credible. If it is, we baptize them. We don't do confirmation because we don't have to, right? Um, so that's pedo baptism and credo baptism. Those words will forever be in your mind. Now, when you go into a church and you see a little thing, a little like a little box, you know that's either a um, that's either a cigarette thing or an ashtray. Or that's a that's a Pado Baptist thing, right? Hello, I'm kidding about the cigarette thing. Testing us. <laughs> um, every Christian is baptized into Christ. What does that mean? Yeah, died with Christ. Everybody, if you're a Christian this morning, you died with Christ. You were in Christ when he died. You were there. Were you there? And then when he was raised, you were there too. Why? How were you there? 
you were in him. You were in union with him. What happened to him happened to you. Because you identify with him. That means you were baptized into him. That might means that you are a pickle and not a cucumber. You see, your nature has changed because he has changed your nature. He has taken all your sin and has given you all his righteousness. And he's given you power to walk in the newness of life. All you got to do is ask. Got a sin you need to overcome? Try asking to overcome it rather than doing it. And we're all guilty of it, right? We just give in way too easily. So baptize into Christ. We're baptized when Jesus died on the cross, when he raised from the dead. Union and identification are huge. Huge. And baptism is a sign and seal of that identification. When we are identified with the Lord, we are Christ ones, Christ's ones, which is what the word Christian means. We are Christ ones. And the Lord's Supper, we talked about this a little bit, instituted the night before his crucifixion, right? What is it important to do um, before you partake? We talk about it all the time. What do you do? Examine. Examine yourself, right? And ask the Lord to forgive you of any sins that you have committed. And also, what's important also to be in right relation with the Lord and with others. If I'm not right in relation with others, what depending upon what it is, right, uh, I may not partake. So, what's the big thing we're doing when we take communion? We what? It says it right on the communion table. Remembering what? Remember. remember. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? It's to remember. And what do we remember? We remember his substitutionary atonement. The broken bread represents his broken body and the wine represents his blood. Right? And he atoned for our sins by the bread, the body, and the blood. Right? Now, what's wrong with movies like the What's it called? The Passion of the Christ. What's wrong with those movies where they show, you know, physical torture of Christ? And one guy said to me after, he said, I can't believe all he went through. It wasn't all that he went through. It wasn't all that he went through, though. The bigger thing was what he experienced what in our place. Not only did he experience physical death in our place, but more than that, spiritual death in our place. Right? That's why he said those words. Read. Ali, Ali, lama sabachthani. My Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? He's in perfect communion with the Trinity. But at that point, as the song says, the Father turns his face away the sin. He drank it to the dregs. A cup full of all the sins of all his people from all time. Drank it to the dregs, meaning right to the bottom. All the junk on the bottom too. 
That's what he did for us. Can you imagine? Do you realize what kind of sin that is? It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable. But if you're a saved person, your sin, don't hear it anymore. The devil may say, but you. <laughs> say, but Christ. Amen. Amen? So how can we ever in a movie portray the spiritual death of Christ? I don't know how to do that. I don't think we should. I don't think we should either. Amen. Amen to that. I don't think we should go there. Now, remember Adam and Eve? <laughs> um, real quickly... Didn't the Lord say that the day you eat of it, you will surely die? Did they die? No, no. He said when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay, did they die? Yes. Why didn't I die right away? Because they died spiritually, correct. And was it great? Was there was there grace in the curse? Oh yeah. Yeah. What was it? What was it? Imagine if they died physically and spiritually then. They would go right straight to hell. But they didn't. And what did the Lord do? They were standing there naked with a, a fig leaf in front of their, you know, what? Um, what did the Lord do? He made them some clothes. Out of what? Dead animals. Was anything killed before then? No. That was the first killing ever done by God and put on those animal skins. Why? To cover their sin. He gave them the opportunity to come to Christ. He covered them. Right? Thank God for that. There's grace. There was grace in that covenant. Because they spiritually died, but there was a chance of life. Wasn't there? They even mentioned Jesus by stepping on the snake's head. Let's see. What else do we want to do? Oh, by the way, um, real quick. This is my body. Right? Mm -hmm. Who says that? Jesus. Jesus. Um, priests say that. Sometimes they emphasize different words. Sometimes they say, this is my body. This is my body. This is my body. This is my body. Do the elements actually become the body and blood of Jesus? So the answer is no. In some traditions, do they? They think they do. They call that what? Transubstantiation. Have you ever been to a Catholic Mass? Do you remember when the bells ring? Right around the time you're doing the thing? That's when it's supposed to happen. What about Lutherans? They have the same thing. It's called consubstantiation. It's kind of close. What about you and I? What do we have? Do we believe that these elements are actually the body and blood of the Lord? No. But like Sam said, I think it was Sam, or maybe it was Nori, said they were symbols. And um, it's a symbolic thing. Uh, let's see what else we want to say. So communion's a reminder, isn't it? As we remember. And the Christian life is much like that. There's many things that we have to remember that we choose so often to forget or we just forget inadvertently but we need to remember the depth 
of what he did for us and apply it to our lives. And that's hard to live the truth, but we need to do it. How do we do, how do we live the truth? By God's word, but what do you need with God's word? A coffee? He said it. He said it. He said it. Faith. You've got to have faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Why it's a fight? Unbelief will come right at you. Don't do it. Don't do it. Believe. That's it for now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these signs and seals of our salvation. We thank you for our precious salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand these things more deeply. In Christ's name, amen.